The promised land that God gave his people is at a crossroads. It's in what is simultaneously the most strategically advantageous place in the ancient world and the most strategically horrible spot in the ancient world, where Africa meets Asia, where Europe comes together in the Middle East, where the Spice and the Silk Road travels all the way to China, goods coming from China, goods coming from India, armies marching, armies marching east and west in great conflict with one another. This is where Israel is located. Now, if you've got a strong king who has a wise strategy and has a big army, as in the days of Solomon, the borders of the Holy Land, the borders of Israel reach their maximum extent. And it also means that any goods traveling between the continents of planet Earth, well, adjusted for inflation, Solomon got a nickel of every dollar that passed through. This makes you extraordinarily wealthy and extraordinarily powerful. Unfortunately, it means that anyone who can weaken you, defeat you, conquer you, possess you, they will possess this key hub of antiquity. As soon as Solomon dies, the kingdom is divided. Because of the arrogance of his son, Rehoboam, the northern kingdom becomes Israel, and the small southern kingdom of Judah persists. They are weakened. A house divided against itself cannot stand. They even fight with one another. And in recent months, we've had those texts of the Old Testament where they take their own relatives captive as if to sell them into slavery until warned by the prophet of God. So much weaker than they were. Finally, ultimately, though, through those years of darkness and weakness, through the years of idolatry and faithlessness, the southern kingdom of Judah gets King Josiah. And King Josiah cleans the temple, reorganizes the religious practices, restores the Passover, cleanses all of the idols out of his country, tears down the pagan worship spots. He asserts the strength, purity, doctrine, and life of his nation. And then war comes. And it's not even war that involves Judah directly because they're at a crossroads. The resurgent Babylonian Empire is fighting with the Assyrian Empire. The mighty Egyptian Empire wants to come to the assistance of Assyria. They march their armies through the Holy Land, and Josiah the king goes out to meet them with an army of Judah. To which the Egyptians say, what does this have to do with you? But a country, a nation that has no borders is not a nation. And Josiah says, it's over. The free passage through our territory is done. And so war ensues very handily. The Egyptians crush the army of Judah. They kill King Josiah. The dream of a rebuilt nation, the dream of a purified kingdom, quickly dies. The chaos which ensues in this place, that is the crossroads of the ancient world, ensues because of their division within themselves. Pharaoh marches through, having killed Josiah. After he gets defeated at the Battle of Karshemish, he stops on the way back and finds that the second son of Josiah has been made king. Jehoahaz is king in Judah because his older brother Jehoiakim is an evil and soulless man, according to the nobles of Judah. So Pharaoh decides that Jehoahaz would make a nice trophy, packs him in his luggage and takes him to Egypt, leaving Judah to be ruled by the soulless, evil man, Jehoiakim. There will be a quiz on all these names later. If I had to practice them last night, you need to know them. So the passing over the rightful heir, they go with the next. He reigns for three months and ends up taken to Egypt where he will die in captivity. The wicked and soulless Jehoiakim is made king and he revives all the evil pagan practices that his father had exterminated. He brings back the idols and the idolatry. He openly mocks God, saying that the God of the Bible gives you nothing but light. And he found it much nicer to look at the sparkle of all of his gold than any light God ever gave him. As a result, the kingdom will continue to be divided, continue to be in decay, morally, spiritually, politically. 
They now pay annual tribute to the Pharaoh of Egypt to support the so-called independence of their idolatrous king. And this will go on until the Babylonians realize that having defeated Egypt, Egypt doesn't get to own Judah. So Nebuchadnezzar comes with the Babylonian army, defeats and kills Jehoiakim, replaces him with the next son, whose name is Jehoiakim. You got to say, when you name your kids the exact same name with one different letter, that's really creative. Jehoiakim is made king until the, well, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gets tired of him and takes him to captivity in Babylon, leaving us with the fourth son of the great king Josiah, a weak, pathetic figure named Zedekiah. Whew, I actually got all those out. The moral of the story is they're a small, divided, pathetic nation surrounded by three emerging superpowers of the ancient world. Egypt was crippled by God during the Exodus, but 200 years after that, they really rebuilt under a really smart pharaoh. And that was 800 years in the past by now. Egypt was a mighty empire again, but so is Babylon now. So is Assyria, growing nation states that gobble up more territory, gobble up more people then need more territory and resources to feed said people. It's a cycle of growth. And those in the Holy Land who've been given that land God had promised them find themselves trapped in this spot. The most advantageous and disadvantage, dis but that's not even a word, disadvantageous place on earth. The promised land that God gave his people is a crossroads and a house divided against itself cannot stand. The real lesson, well, most of the kingdom period, the real lesson that comes down to the, through the ages for us is that of the house divided. So they're given the strategic spot and they're unable to hold it because they defy the God of the covenant who promised to hold it for them. When they were faithful to God, they were a powerful and great nation in control of the crossroads Certainly not an accident at all. It was God's holy land that is chosen for, there's a variety of reasons and theories, but certainly spreading the word of God from this place to all of the earth down those roads of travel. The rumors and legends and stories that will cross the entire globe as it was known then because of that location. But because they break the covenant, because they do not stay true to the word of God, his doctrine, life, and practice, because they reject him to the point that, that he's even mocked openly by Jehoiakim, because of that, God does not protect them and they are victimized by everybody around them. This is precisely you and me and our life in the world. We have been baptized in the Red Sea. We have been fed the manna from heaven and the water from the rock to be a saint of Jesus Christ, to be one called to be separate from the world, to be in this strategic spot where heaven and earth touch, where time and eternity come together, where the veil opens and we behold these eternal things, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who is God and man, risen, glorified, permanent, eternal, everlasting, omnipresent. This place, this crossroads, this gateway, to our own promised land in the next life. You and I placed here are outside the kingdoms of the world, but we are beset by them. We are surrounded by increasing lust, devouring the power and glory of the world, whether it is money, whether it is the shimmer of gold, whether it is lust and pleasure, drugs, influence, politics. There's a million different ways our sin expresses itself in the world. The kingdoms of darkness, the kingdoms of this world, and Lucifer, who is behind so many of them, hiding behind the curtain, behind the mask. These are the things that surround and threaten and assail us. We live our lives as ones who can give in, be weak. We can give in to the idolatry of the world and let them have their high places. We can split our loyalties like so many of the kings of Judah and Israel worshiping the Lord, but also doing some of that other pagan stuff we think is cool. We can just give it up altogether and run with the crowd like Jehoiakim did, mocking God. 
but the place where God calls us to be as Christian people, people washed, redeemed, and sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Ghost is to be here in this crossroads, the place where earth and heaven touch and a house divided against itself cannot stand. This is the decay of Christianity in the world, not just the northern and southern kingdom of Israel and Judah, no, 50 million different expressions of different doctrine. The devil loves nothing better than to obscure the true meaning of the scripture and the historical context of right doctrine than with our ego, with our own wisdom, our own choices and decisions. And taking away the word of God to the extent that most churches that call themselves churches, most denominations, no longer hold that the Bible is the word of God, not really or not in any fashion at all. Though all these different ways that a house divided against itself cannot stand, and yet, what happens after the days of Josiah? It's absolutely heartbreaking to think that King Josiah spent all that time creating a better kingdom and restoring faith only to discover that you cannot change what people believe in their hearts, of course. The king was a good man who ruled a kingdom of foul and despicable people that overwhelmingly had hidden their idols under their bed or buried them in the backyard for the day that the good King Josiah was gone. All of this wickedness reasserts itself. The kingdom falls apart. Heirs to the throne die hostages in foreign lands. And when, the, when Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had had enough, he begins packing off the population. To permanently make Judah part of his empire, he figures to deport much of the population to Babylon and bring in a new population. It's how you control empires in the ancient world. Disconnect people from their land, their heritage, their history, their language, their religion, by moving them around to different parts of your empire. But even against all of those odds, all of the things they were gifted by the Lord God that they crumpled up and threw in the garbage in front of him. All of the incredible blessings that could have been had as they filter away. There's the constant reminder that the word of God and his promises are the things which last. Yes, they had a covenant in the Old Testament. There were things they were expected to do and then God would do certain things. But behind all of that, Above, beyond, outside of all of that specific covenant law was the promise given to Adam and Eve, the promise given to Noah, the promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promise to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Nothing human beings do can interfere with that. No matter how dark, evil, twisted, how in league with Satan they are, no matter how we fail as faithful people to toe the line. No matter how many times we sin, we fail, we get it wrong, no matter the intentional attacks of the world and Lucifer or the unintentional attacks of our frailty and weakness, the promise of God remains unaffected. At a time when everything seemed lost, the temple had been destroyed, the people were scattered, their kings had died essentially as captives, but the people would return from the Babylonian captivity. Not, not because the nation had to be rebuilt, but because the line of the Messiah was always the point of all of that history. The line of the Christ remains intact. The line and destiny, the predestiny, probably not a good word, the line and plan of God's, that God become man for the sins of the world, crucified, risen, glorified, the plan for the atonement of all sin was never affected by any of this. Our frailty, our weakness, or our downright evil cannot interfere with that. It is God's promise. It is God's plan. It will all unfold according to his will. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. In the long run, it is the devil's kingdom which is divided by its lust for various things in the world. The kingdom of God in Christ has never wavered. Always the plan of salvation has been working through all of that history and all of that tragedy and the heart-breaking reality of the fall of the kingdom of Judah and going into captivity can be tempered for us in hindsight and was then for those of faith with the confidence and the true faithful assurance 
that liberation would come. Perhaps not by soldiers or by chariots, not by the reassertion of their independence or their nationhood. They would get it for a brief time, not because they were glorious and strong and powerful in the world, but the inevitable victory of God in Christ, the fulfillment of promises all the way back to the garden. However, we exist in the crossroads of the world. However, we fail because we are divided against ourselves as a, a world, a nation, a church, each of us as individuals split between our saintly self and our sinful self, the kingdom of God in Christ will still have the victory. He will pick over the ruins of everything we have wrecked through history and he will exalt it back to its perfection right here at the crossroads where time and eternity touch, where the veil opens. We are washed, redeemed, absolved. We are fed here in this place where Christ the King as the perfect reign forever and ever. In Jesus' name.